if we look at the 2022 Bills receiver group, right? You have Stephon Diggs, Gabe Davis. Everybody's comfortable going one and two there, right? You're calling them your one and your two. Cole Beasley, future a little bit in question. Some people might not say that it is, but future probably a little bit in question, more so than it was last year. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. Uh, we can agree on that, okay. right? Yep. Was Gabe Davis ultimately effective because in the first half of the season, he saw near no action, and in the second part of the season, he was slowly integrated in, and then at the back, very back half of the season, he was actually leveraged as a talent, right? Was that what made Gabe Davis so effective? Was that, because we talk about it all the time, you have to change the offense, right? You got to change the way that you do business. And we complained about the running game for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, right? Yeah. But was Gabe Davis actually the change for this offense? Was he the change? Hashtag Sports is proud to partner with Mr. Rogers Homes. Sean Rogers is a proud Western New Yorker and is now your Arizona relocation specialist. You can see his reviews as a top 1% agent on Zillow, Homes, and Trulia.com. Go ahead and download his free Arizona relocation guide found in the description of this video. Subscribe to his YouTube channel and, as Sean would say, God bless America and go Bills. You can take this a variety of ways. Was it Bates? Was it teams playing the Bills differently? Was it the fact that the, you know, the running game started to pick up a little bit? I think we, we, we preach this many times, and I think it, it really fits right now. You you have to earn your spot on a McDermott team. Totally agree. Okay. Yep. Maybe he, you know, maybe while certain aspects of the position he got, bringing Emmanuel Sanders in, maybe to help develop Gabe Davis, second half of the year, it, it started to click for him. Mm -hmm. So then he started to earn his his reps. Yeah. So if he earned his reps in that respect, you know, because McDermott's not going to put you on the field until he has 100% trust. Totally true. Um, even though he's a defensive guy, that's how he runs his, his, his deal. So I think that could have been that could, that could have been the case. Is that Gabe, Gabe Davis opened up so many more things for your offense mm -hmm. because – I mean, now, now don't get me wrong. We're speaking highly of Gabe Davis. He's not a number one. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Like, I may much. offend people by this, but there is a reason why Gabe Davis had the success that he did. Um, I mean, I, I liken it to the Buffalo Sabres a long, long time ago when the Buffalo Sabres were stacked. You remember when they were just stacked? And Vanek, Thomas Vanek was playing on the third line. Yep. And someone actually asked Lindy Ruff, they said, hey, why is Vanek having such a great year this year? <laughs> Ruff goes, he's on the third line. Yeah. He's playing with he's playing with Pominville and Afeneganov. Like mm -hmm. of, <laughs> our first two lines are studs. Like right. he's, play, he's playing against third line guys. Mm -hmm. Well, Davis is facing number two corners, maybe number three corners if you're talking about Beasley in the slot. Yeah. So what we wanted to see from Davis, we've seen where can you dominate the guy that's yeah. not the number one. Right. Right. It doesn't mean you're a number one. Totally agree. Yep. So that all being said, I think he proved to you that, okay, now we have a formidable, affordable piece across from Stefan Diggs. Mm -hmm. How much is he going to cost them in two yeah. years? Yeah. That's the only thing. But I think it does open up a lot of things for your offense, Evan Davis. Just the sheer size that he has with his ability to keep his feet at the sideline is scary. Right. Because usually you see six foot guys that have that, not six two, two two fifteen. Guys. And I think it's I think it's important to call out that Gabe Davis is not a burner. He's not. You see him downfield a lot, and that is because uh, he has done a great job of reading his responsibility and understanding his route and understanding the concept. Have you seen him run though? He moves. A stride is five yards, dude. He moves. See the big dude. You know, it's. I think it was fascinating because I, I know the dichotomy between Cole Beasley and Gabe Davis is not one that you would typically put next to each other, right? <laughs> but the fact that Gabe Davis just incredibly outpaced Cole Beasley in targets the last eight games of the season, mm -hmm. including playoffs. 
No, in the last 10 games. I think Gabe Davis had like 17 targets the first eight games of the season. In the last 10 games of the season, he outpaced Beasley in targets, right? That says an awful lot about the direction of your offense. Yeah. You know, it really does. Going more vertical. Right. So the question to me is how valuable is that slot receiver position really, right? It's still valuable. I think it's still valuable, sure. Chicken or the egg, Paul? If, if you're a defense coming in and you think that the slot position is where Beasley can kill you, let's say it's second and four. Mm-hmm. Who are you going to pay more attention to? But isn't the slot position really only effective when you have a running game? No, not necessarily. I don't think it would be. I mean, if you got Gabe Davis in the slot blocking for the run game. Well, I think there's – it's weird, right? Because the NFL is is very strange in this respect. Either your slot guy is five foot seven, or your slot guy is like six three. Like either you got Juju Smith or, or Kyle Pitts, or Kyle Pitts in the slot, yeah. uh, you know, or um, you know, either you have that or Nikhil Harry in the slot, right? You got these freaking monsters in the slot, or you have Braxton Berrios, you know, or you know these, li- these little Crowder. guys, Crowder. Yeah. My, my my point being is that if you're on a like maybe the Bills offense switched up in the respect of okay if, if you're coming out and it's second and four second and five, obviously you're gonna delegate assignments to Diggs you're gonna delegate assignments to Beasley yeah who who's that open up right it opens up Davis right maybe maybe Allen has progressed to the, the point where he's reading second level now not just taking the first downs where some people actually mention that. Last year, like, why is he just taking the easy throw? Why is he trying to stretch the field? Right. Well, you know, he might be wants to loosen up things from the You know, who knows? I, I want to go back to the, I think the slot receiver is really only effective in a team where the run game is effective. And the reason I say that, hmm. and, and go with me on this journey for a second, right? Yeah. If you're a team that ineffectively runs the football, how far down are those linebackers really? Where, where are they really? How effective are, are is your slot receiver really? If those linebackers are... If you run the ball the, well... Those linebackers... And those linebackers are hugging the line or something. Right. The linebackers first step. So your their slot, first mental step is for them. So you're saying your slot receiver is not as valuable in a run-heavy team? No. Or I'm saying is, their slot receiver is more valuable in a run-heavy team because those linebackers, their first mental step is down. Hmm. Right? And that slot receiver can exploit that. Right? Get in behind... What do we see right now with Cole Beasley? He's, not He's always in front of linebackers. There's just nothing you can do about it, right? The Bills ineffectively ran the football almost the entire season, and Cole Beasley was, you know, he was a he. Like there were some games he saw 11, 13 targets, and then the next game two, right? Well, I look, okay. Let's 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 take, let's take a step back here for a second. We've often said that Beasley supplements the run game for you mm-hmm. in the routes that he runs. Sure. So Beasley running a quick little whip route for three yards is technically the equivalent to handing out the Singletary off the table. Sure. Okay. Okay. So maybe in those games where he had 13 targets, the run game wasn't really getting it. Wasn't really picking up. But. So you had that to supplement that little short thing. But you're making my point for me. No, but I'm, I'm, So you're saying that if they ran the ball – well in those games, then Beasley didn't have many targets. I'm saying his targets would have been more effective. I, I think I think we're getting crossed up here. So, so you're saying that Beasley supplemented the run game. Yes. I agree with you. Okay. Because they needed to try and get the linebackers down. Mm-hmm. Right? They needed to try and get the linebackers to come down. So if you're going to run a three-yard whip to, to Cole Beasley, you the whole goal is to try and get the linebackers down. Right? Yeah. If the linebackers are already down because of another another part of the game, another part of your offensive system that's forcing those linebackers for a mental step forward, then your slot receiver can exploit the holes in coverage. That's not what Beasley was used for this year. Mm. Beasley was used to, I agree with you, to supplement the, an ineffective run game. And that made him ineffective as a slot receiver. So that's not what they're supposed to do. So you're saying that as the year progressed near the end of the year when Singletary started to pick it up and the run game started to pick it up, you saw less of these. Thank you for going on this journey with me. I, it was fun, but 
for you disagree with me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't disagree with you at all. My point is this. If you move on from Cole Beasley mm -hmm. and your running game suffers with the new zone scheme because it's going to be hard for them, I think. Not hard, but tough for them to learn initially. What do you do to supplement the run game if you don't have Cole Beasley? I'm not running ill anymore. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the answer. No, the, I'm not. That's the answer. Damn you. Isn't that the answer? Mario, come on. That's the answer. Right? I thought, did, did we not start one of these conversations with the longevity of Josh Allen? <laughs> totally great. I totally agree. But, you know, that's the answer, right? That's, wow, if it all goes to hell, go get him, Josh. I understand <laughs> in case of emergency, maybe you run him three or four times. Mm -hmm. But not as a consistent diet. Not for not for seventeen weeks. No, God, no. Yeah, I, I mean, I I agree with you. I agree with you. But does all this being said, what does that mean for addressing the wide receiver position? And is it a position that you need to address? I think a lot of questions will be answered in the draft in this offseason, based on what the Buffalo Bills do. Like if they if they let go of Beasley, they've made their decision. What if they sign Jameson Crowder? Oh, God. What if they sign Crowder? What if they re-sign John Brown? John Brown's last lock guy. Well, the two two vastly different skill sets. That's what. But that's what I'm saying is what do what do those two like? Just let's just use those two signings as examples, right? Jameson Crowder, career slot guy. John Brown, career wide. What? If you sign one of them, what does that say about what direction you're going? That means Cole Beasley, if you sign John Brown, Cole Beasley is out. And you're putting Gabe Davis in the slot and you're running a lot more vertical. So you're not running I think that's an interesting game. idea. I think if you sign Jameson Crowder, you're trying to spread the offense, the defense east and west so you can run the ball and attack us in the zone zone. What do you think they're going to do? I don't think Gabe, they're signing. Well, I don't think they're going to sign either of those players, but. I think. What they're going to have. Uh -oh. Isaiah Hodges is, is healthy. Oh, <laughs> come on. He's my new favorite. I don't care. Like, I, I mean, I got to pick somebody new because the star is going to be gone. And Beasley's going to be gone. And you Rick, need a new favorite? I, I'm, Rick Bates. I, Rick Bates will be Jersey's gone. Jersey's already in the mail. So he's did already, you really order a Bates jersey? He's already going to have his first two games are going to suck. So <laughs> did you really order a Bates jersey? I'm not That is the kiss denying. of death. Your jersey collection is terrible. You have one of the worst Bills jersey collections on the face of this earth. Guys, it is the kiss of death. Mario, would you mind sharing with the folks the jerseys that you own? Please. Fred Jackson. Okay, that's, that's, that's a no-brainer. That's that's a layup. Okay, please continue. Paul Puzlesny. <laughs> Keep going. Starla Tula there. Okay. Josh Allen. Okay, again, layup. Layup. Stephon Diggs. Okay, yeah, layup. Those that's like getting a Bruce jersey. Like you'll be able to wear those jerseys forever. Mario right? Williams. Okay, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so much about that position that's gonna tell you about the rest of the offense. It's gonna tell you so much. And I just don't, I want to make sure that people understand that, you know, the type of decisions that they make are going to tell you everything you need to know about what direction they're going. And it's a guess, you know, I, I don't know. For you. Yeah. you said Jameson Crowder or John Brown. Yeah. I, they're just first examples off the top of my head. What if it's Evan Ingram? Oh, you dirty, dirty, <laughs> dirty man. You dirty man. Or David Njoku. Oh, Njoku. That's fascinating. Can you imagine him in the slot? Njoku's a freak. He is. He's a freak. He's a freak athlete, man. He's he's the uh, who's the guy from Florida? OJ Howard. I put all three of those guys in the same category as far as athleticism. So weird, right? Because all from the same draft, I think. I think they were all from the same draft. If my memory serves me correct. Oh, no, no, no. Howard couldn't have been. Howard got his fifth-year option picked up. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, those they were supposed to be the next generation of freak athlete tight ends. And where are we? I, I just think the systems weren't, weren't built for that. 
I agree. But one guy went to Cleveland. This is no, okay. one yeah. guy went to New York where he's had three coaches. Mm-hmm. And one guy and, and went to Tampa. Went to Tampa mm-hmm. where they, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't have Arians even at the they time. They don't want his particular skill set. No. no Arians isn't going to use that position no. like that. No. But then, I don't know. The only reason Gronk was effective was because he had Brady. Brady force fed Gronk. Oh, he did. He, under, he understood to, to get Gronk's skill set. Yeah, he understood Gronk's skill set. Yeah. But, so, wait, wait, wait. Let me unpack this a little bit. So, you're thinking maybe the slot position is addressed through tight end. So you are, oh, oh, are the Bills back on the board for a tight end in the draft this season? Oh, oh, oh. Mrs. Robinson, are you trying to seduce me? 